Hi, I'm Richard Westby, and welcome to the IVF Daddies podcast. Today, I would love to welcome back Molly O'Brien, who in our last chat discussed egg donation. And today, we're here to go through the legal aspects of surrogacy. Hi, Molly. Hello, and thank you for having me back. You're welcome. It's great to have you. Molly, you're the former chair of the American Society of Reproductive Medicine Legal Professional Group, a member of the American Bar Association, and you were voted to be the president of the SEEDS organization, the Society of Ethics in Egg Donor and Surrogacy. And you're a partner at the International Fertility Law Group in Los Angeles. So jumping straight into the topic of surrogacy, can you explain to me what is in a surrogacy contract? Oh my gosh, I sure can. So apart from what we discussed in the egg donation, with egg donation being a simple transfer of property ownership, surrogacy is a lot more complicated. The legal contract is much longer, more detailed, because we are dealing with parental rights when it comes to surrogacy. Okay. And the reason why we have to do this contract is because eventually you're going to get a court order that names the parents as the parents and ensures that the surrogate has no legal rights. And we have to do that because a hospital will always assume that the person giving birth is the parent, unless we give them legal documentation to prove otherwise. And when is that done? Those are, that's done during the pregnancy. In most cases, there are a few states in the United States where this is done post-birth. So if it's done pre-birth, that is done. So you'll turn up to the, the hospital with a document that says exactly. that the baby is yours and otherwise the baby is born. And then what? It, there's some states that you can do a pre-birth order and a post-birth order where you would get the pre-birth order to ensure the parental rights are locked in for the parents, but everything isn't really completed and secured until after the birth. So in some states, there is a little bit of a timeline where the surrogate is technically the legal parent until that paperwork is completed. Scary. It can be, but hopefully by then you have a beautiful relationship with your surrogate, you trust her, and this is a non-issue. And I can tell you, in 20 years I've been doing this, I have never seen it be an issue. Okay, cool. So you have you ever been in the situation where there has been a surrogate saying, I don't want the parents to be involved, or like, how does that work? Saying that she doesn't want the parents involved in like the pregnancy or in the delivery, or that she doesn't want them to become the parents. Both. Okay. I've seen some relationships not go well where the surrogate has not necessarily wanted communication or involvement with the parents. That's not exactly common, but I have seen it. I have never seen a situation where a surrogate didn't want the parents to have the parental rights. I've never seen a surrogate want to keep the child or have any parental rights. But I've, of course, heard of cases which were done by unethical agencies, matches that never should have been made and things like that. Yeah, because that was one of my biggest fears, in all mm -hmm. honesty, when I was doing this, was well, you go through the whole process and then all of a sudden you end up with no child. And I remember talking to my surrogate probably at around a month before we signed the contract. She was like, interestingly, my biggest fear is that you don't want to come and take your child home. So we actually had the same fear, but had we not have spoken about it, we would have been, I don't know, just, yeah. It's kind I of actually hear that all the time, where the surrogates are afraid that of that and the parents are afraid of the same thing. It's, we can all come together and agree. <laughs> just communicate, guys. Communication yeah. is key. Yeah. As with everything in life, communication is key. So then I guess things that I, I always remember talking to my surrogate as well, I said, can I buy you a gym membership? Can I make can I buy you organic food? And she was like, I eat organic and I'm a member of a gym, so you're good. What goes into a contract? Yes. So there's two parts to a contract. One will be strictly financial and one is going to talk about the relationship aspects. Now the financial part will be dictated by the agency that is doing the matching and carrying the parties through the journey. The agency will have a benefit package that talks about the compensation the surrogate will receive and it will talk about any of the other ancillary items like lost pay, housekeeping, childcare, things like that. What the lawyer should do in the contract is make sure every category has some sort of limit on it somehow, either in a financial cap or in a time limit cap. Okay, so what you explain that because obviously it, a time cap and a finance cap, what does that mean? Yeah. So, for example, something like a maximum of $1,500 shall be allocated to this category. It would be the financial cap. And then a time limit would be, you won't be responsible for this for more than six weeks after a birth. 
or more than oh, eight okay, weeks fine. after. I see. So for example, if as my surrogate did, she had a cesarean, so she couldn't lift exactly. and do things. So you are in, you are contractually obliged to pay for something to help her clean the During house her recovery. Or, yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Okay, fine. But you're saying that you can either time limit it or financially limit it mm-hmm. so it doesn't get out of control. Mm-hmm. Okay. Exactly. And what if she's on bed rest? Yes. So bed rest, for those that don't Should. know, is when a doctor says you need to go and lie down and not move because your pregnancy is at risk. Mm-hmm. So there's two aspects to that. There's compliance with medical order aspect, and then there's the financial aspect. Most contracts and most agencies will have a bed rest stipend of X number of dollars per week to cover her for childcare and housekeeping or whatever else she might need. And she would, of course, be entitled to lost pay during that time if she was working and needed to take off of work. So that's the financial aspect of it, also limited by a properly drafted contract. The other aspect of it is medical compliance. Well, if my surrogate's written on bed rest, how do I know she's actually doing bed rest? How do I know what she's doing? She's not out and about. Exactly. A lot of that is trust. You need to trust the surrogate you're working with. And I also get the question a lot of parents is, well, how do I know that she's just, even if she's not on bed rest, how do I know she's looking after the pregnancy? How do I know that she is doing what she's supposed to be doing? And this starts from the beginning. When you're getting a surrogate profile to consider matching with, you're going to get a particular feeling when you read it. And then when you have your first initial call with her, you'll probably get a feeling too. It's a little bit like dating, but this is a non-romantic feeling. (laughs) But it's a click. Something clicks and you're like, wow, we we like her vibe. We like her personality. And she's going to feel the same way about you. And when you feel that, this is oftentimes the good normal start to a match. But then one of the other pieces of advice I give to intended parents is I think it's a great idea to do a video call with your surrogate at least once a week. You'll probably text with her more often than that, but you can set the video call up to be like the same time, like Sunday nights at five o'clock or something like that. And look at her, just check out how she looks. Does she look very tired? Does her house look very messy behind her? Are there chickens running around in her kitchen? <laughs> chickens yes. running. Yes, Molly. We've that heard it all. No one. Chickens <laughs> running around in your kitchen. I actually had that happen once. And so the parents then, when you get the context and the visual clues from your conversation with her, you're either going to be put at peace because you're going to look at her and go, wow, she looks really well rested. Things look good. Her kids are under control. Or you're going to be like, holy cow, she looks overwhelmed. She looks tired. We need to do something. And so what, if, if she's looking, <laughs> you have one of those holy cow moments. Yeah. What do you do? I'm- so then the parents pick up the phone and they call me or they call the agency and they say, we need to get her a spa day or we need to get her a housekeeper or I can tell that she is overwhelmed. Can you guys call her and figure out uh, what it is that she needs so that she can take a breather and that she can be looking after herself and that she has less stress going on in her life. And the, I guess this is a question then. If you've got a contract that says X, Y, Z, but mm-hmm. you sit there and you say, you really need a spa day, mm-hmm. that's not in the contract. Can you still go ahead and do that? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. And I prefer not adding extras into the contract, the written contract, because then they seem more like a gift. If you wanted to do that, I don't recommend big, huge, don't buy her a car, don't buy her a house, but something like a spa day or give her a family date night where you get a gift card to a restaurant that you know that she likes to go to or that the agency can investigate and find out where she likes to go and maybe some movie tickets or something like that. Little things like that along the way that don't cost a lot of money will build a lot of goodwill because the surrogate wants to be recognized for this amazing gift that she is giving the parents. And so when you give her that FaceTime, and then when you care and when you notice these things about her, that is just going to build the trust in the relationship between the two of you. And she's going to want to do everything she can to be the best possible surrogate she can be for you. Wow. Yeah, that's, I, yeah, that's really a really valid piece of advice. The little gestures go along as with life in general, right? It goes really long way. That does bring me on to a topic that a lot of people don't want to talk about, but I think is very important. What do we do contractually around things like termination? Mm -hmm. How does that work? I mean, so it's a very sensitive topic, but needs discussing. Yeah. So that's the other part of the contract. You have your financial part, but then you have your emotional and relationship aspects that are dealt with in the body of the contract. 
and abortion or termination of pregnancy is one of those things. This is a key discussion to have on that first quote unquote date with your surrogate, that first match meeting, match call. have this conversation because if you feel differently about termination of a pregnancy than your surrogate does, you are not a good match no matter how much you might like each other. So that means, for example, if you are pro the ability to mm -hmm. have a termination mm -hmm. if needed and she is anti that, mm -hmm. exactly, then that's not a good exactly. match, right? Yes. And it will be written in her profile. So it goes like this. You will get a profile of a surrogate. She will have description of her medical history, things she likes, her those kinds of things. And termination of pregnancy will be dealt with in that profile and or application. So you will already know, but it should also be discussed on this call. And there should be an intermediary like the agency talking to each of you about where your boundaries lie. My advice is this. I feel like the intended parents should have the right to ask the surrogate for a termination of pregnancy for any medical reason that they might want to ask for it. And she should agree to do it if they ask her to. If you start getting too detailed in a contract, you can go down a very dangerous path of what if we forgot one of these things and that's the very thing that ends up happening. So making it nice and broad with any medical reason gives the parents the right to decide what where their comfort level lies. And then I guess this then comes to a bigger question. What happens if you say we would like to terminate and she says no? So this is something that can happen. You can contract for a termination of pregnancy, but you cannot force somebody to have one. And you can't stop somebody from having one against your wishes. Even if it's written in the contract. Even if it's written in the contract. So what that becomes is it becomes a breach of the contract to which a properly drafted contract will have rights and remedies for the intended parents to seek if the surrogate refused their request, if it was a proper request, or if the surrogate terminated the pregnancy against their wishes, which, by the way, I've never seen a surrogate do. Okay. Whew, it's, a, it's a heavy topic. Sorry. It is. I, yeah. yeah. But it, I, it's one it's of those... It's important. It is, because I was always very fearful of what would we do and how would we deal with this and is... It's big. It's big. So then another similar question is, if there's a breach of contract, mm -hmm. remedies for that typically would be what? So the breaches of contract, you can technically go to the lawyers and throw the contract in somebody's face if you want to. But I don't think that's the smart way to behave. I think if you notice a breach of contract or if you feel like you might have breached the contract then the first thing we should do is try to work it out maybe with the agency, not involving the lawyers. Start at a base level of, hey, let's figure this out. Let's try to work it out. Because sometimes it can be fixed and fixed easily. So yeah. let's do it that way if we can. Then if there's still non-compliance, then you bring the lawyers in. And if you have to send a breach of contract letter, you can do that. Parents should have the right to freeze payments to the surrogate if she's continually non-compliant with something. I'm really grateful to say this is usually a non-issue, and this is maybe a controversial thing to say right now, but, and I hate to say this as a lawyer, <laughs> but ideally with a surrogacy match, you want to have a good contract and you never want to look at it again after you sign it. It's almost like you have oops moments where you're like, yeah. oh, did you notice? Let's get this fixed. And then the mm -hmm. agency can jump in and get it right. fixed and then you just move on. Yeah. You don't ever want to have to be going back and nitpicking parts of the contract. Yeah. That's Nobody's happy if that's going on. Yeah. Get a good contract as a backbone to know that everybody's safe and protected, but let's never have to deal with that contract again. Everybody should just behave. Yeah. I guess that comes back down to that communication thing. If and you're the trust. The trust mm -hmm. and you're making little gestures because mm -hmm. surrogates are amazing human beings who mm -hmm. are putting their lives on the line really mm -hmm. for us to have exactly. our dreams come true. I think maybe a little bit of leeway on, on, mm -hmm. on this is a great thing. Can I say something on that real quick? Of course you may. This is not legal advice, but this is a good tip go with your heart and go with your gut instinct. And when you do that initial call with the surrogate and if something doesn't feel right, it's probably not a good match. And it's far better for you to go back onto a waiting list or to wait for the right surrogate than it is to push it with the wrong surrogate because you will live in a constant state of anxiety and fear through the whole pregnancy. That's a really good point. So do you ever see people being presented with a match of a surrogate by an agency and them going... No, 
Don't I want d- to use that. I do. And I see surrogates say no too, because they don't get a good feeling. Both sides should be picking each other here. And if anybody's forcing it because they're afraid of waiting longer or they're afraid of the multitude of things that can happen, that's not good. That's not healthy. Wait for the one where you go, yes, this is her. And that really does bring it home that everybody can say, this isn't right for me at this moment in time. That's not what I want to do. And you don't have to. And that's what the compensation is for, honestly, is when you're able to openly and properly compensate somebody for this gift that they're giving, you have an absolute higher standard of expectation and care that you can get for that. And that is why in these some of these other countries where this is not out in the open, people being taken advantage of. I guess that's just one of the th- reasons. Why, uh, that's the reason I chose the United mm-hmm. States to go through this whole it's process. Ethical. Mm-hmm. It's ethical. It's just psychologically you're just in a much better place because you know that everyone's doing it from the bottom of their heart Mm -hmm. yes obviously there's finances involved and so at what point actually on the financial front what point do we see that compensation turns into coercion that's something that should be sussed out long in advance in my opinion surrogate should have a proper psychological assessment before she ever enters into a written agreement And part of that psychological assessment will be her motivation behind being a surrogate and whether she shows any psychological indicators of not being compliant or perhaps wanting to bond with the child, things like that. Yeah. So for the... There's a beautiful rainbow right there. Sausages. There we go. (laughs) Do you see it? Sausages. Molly's pointing out the window at a rainbow for all of those gay dads of us out there. It will happen. So... For those of you who didn't understand what the question is, compensation versus coercion, one of the things that I remember talking to somebody about was the fact that if a surrogate is making a compensation level of X amount of dollars, what point is it such that she can't turn down that money and she feels like she has to do it? And I think that's a really valid question It's because it is a lot of money Mm -hmm. and when you look at it as a number, but then you break it down into an hourly wage and it really is not. Right. Um, and on one hand, you can never fully compensate somebody for this amazing gift. But on the other hand, compensations can be extremely high. I will say that if parents do their research into the different styles of agencies and different types of agencies, they will notice the benefit packages range significantly. And if you have an agency that's offering a first-time surrogate an abnormally high compensation, Those are probably more financially motivated surrogates, I should say. Um, And if they're going to an agency like that, you might just want to stop and pause and ask why. When there's plenty of other agencies out there with compensations that aren't quite that high, and they're getting perfectly adequate surrogates too. This comes into a bit of more of a question for you using your history. The... What would be a top tip of yours in choosing a surrogate? So top tips for choosing a surrogate. The first thing is definitely going to be the feeling you get when you read her profile and the feeling you get when you have that initial call. Also, you should think about what it is you're looking for. Do you want somebody who wants a close relationship where you'll be in touch very often? Do you want somebody who is open to FaceTiming you into the video? I'm sorry, FaceTiming you into the OB appointments or things like that, if that's possible. If you want a close relationship with like that, you should seek out a surrogate who wants that same type of relationship back. Because not everybody does. Some surrogates are a little bit more independent. They'll do a great job, but maybe they don't want to be contacted every day. They, they want to be let off on their own. <laughs> so I think that's something to look at. You can think about... Her background, a lot of parents are interested in surrogates who have already finished completing their family. And a lot of surrogates haven't. (laughs) A lot of times they might want to go back and have their own children, more children in the future. Whereas I have some parents who say, look, we don't want to put her at any risk. So we want to make sure she has completed her family so that if something does happen to not go right, we don't feel personally responsible for her losing her fertility in the future or something like that. So those kinds of things, it's a kind of a feeling you get. And I I know that's a bit ethereal and hard to wrap your head around at this stage (laughs) that you're probably listening to this podcast for, but it's a feeling you will get and you will know. Follow your gut. Yeah. I think that's, that's a very valid point that a lot of people should do. And at every step of this process, if it feels right, it probably is. If it feels wrong, it probably is. Mm -hmm. And And there's nothing wrong with stopping. 
pausing, reassessing, and either choosing to go forward or choosing to walk backwards. There's nothing wrong with doing that ever at any point in this process. Yeah. Brilliant. Gosh, Molly, thank you so much for those amazing pearls of wisdom. If you've enjoyed listening to this podcast, please share, listen, subscribe, and do everything that you do normally when you're listening to your podcasts. Molly, thank you so much once again for all that top information. Much appreciated. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me.